Okay, so this has been some time in the making, uh, around six months, as I said, at the last one, the cholesterol conundrum. Uh, and that's what it turned out to be, only evenings and weekends available. Uh, and it's the crucial story of 25-hydroxy-D. So it's called vitamin D, but it's not actually a vitamin. Uh, it's a secosteroid pre-hormone component, uh, and it's one of the most important elements in your body. And I've discovered, as I've researched, to what extent that's true. So, um, I'll just say a quick thank you in advance to a host of experts. I've watched their lectures over the months and uh, gained new understandings as I've pulled papers and studies uh, from the various journals. Uh, and again, we're talking generally full professors who have worked for 30 years plus, and one in fact Professor Michael Hollick, who was in 1971 discovered the active metabolite vitamin D itself, and he's the published discoverer of it, and he spent his whole career working on it. Um, and again, I've had some experts review the material, and it's all up to date with the current literature. Even though some of what you will see will seem quite stark and unsettling, um, it's actually all up to date. Okay, so I won't even go through the agenda for the sake of time. We'll go straight into the prelude. And this is to give an overview of her evolutionary history and the molecules involved. First though, I'll just show a quick flash. In the last decade, the vitamin D research is exploding. And I'll let you just read through some of those things there, and they're actually reflecting studies. And I'll call something out. RCTs are randomized controlled trials, and they are the gold standard uh, of experimental proof. So you'll see a lot of associations in my lecture. You'll see when vitamin D is high, a lot of good stuff happens. When it's low, a lot of bad happens. And some of that isn't necessarily causal. I believe it is, but it's just an association. But randomized control trials are where you change a factor in advance with randomized groups of people and see what happens. And you prove cause and effect. You'll also notice quite a bit about mothers, breast milk, and other things like that. And you'll see figures of 6,000 international units and 4,000 international units. And that's the measurement for the D supplement you take if you're not getting enough sun. But it's in the thousands where it's actually relevant. Uh, unfortunately, the current guidelines indicate 400 or 600 units, and that's uh, not a very meaningful level from my research and from all the other people you saw in the photo. So anyway, if you've absorbed some of that, Ricketts is making a comeback, yes, that's a disease of profound vitamin D deficiency where the child's bones cannot even grow, and they get bow legs, and deformed skeletons. And it's an industrial revolution disease from olden times when children didn't get enough sun in the cities and the smog. And it's rising rapidly in America and the UK. And in Turkey, it went up to 6% of poor children were getting rickets. And they reduced that by a factor of 60 by only giving 400. Because they were so profoundly low, even 400 got them out of trouble. So that gives a little bit of a flash and one of the reasons why a lot of the experts in this field are emotive about it and are finding it very frustrating that the message can't get across the orthodoxy. So vitamin D3, cholecalciferol, is animal world D3 and it's the precursor molecule required. You either ingest it or the sun will create it in your skin in huge quantities. And it's the crucial element and it's provided by UVB light from the sun. There's UVB and UVA, won't get into it now, but UVB, a very narrow uh, section of the spectrum, is what produces it. In your body, the marker in your blood of healthy status is 25 OHD. So basically that's produced in the liver from the D3 you've got from the sun, or in a limited way from the diet, or from supplements. It enabled us to leave the sea. So vertebrates in the sea several hundred million years ago, when they went on the land, they didn't have access to calcium like they did in the sea all around them. So a prerequisite for actually becoming a land animal was D. And that gives an idea of the profound nature of it. Without D, there's no land living because it manages the calcium and puts it into your bones and keeps it out of your vascular tissue. You won't get calcification of your arteries. So there's a massive complex system going on there. But because it was wired into us in the way I just described several hundred million years ago, it has become over evolution inextricably linked into many, many mechanisms throughout the body. So when you see all the diseases I show you linked to it, and you might say, well, how could one thing link so much? Just remember a few hundred million years counts, okay? And an analogy I'm using for this, the body's serum 25 OHD is an ammunition pack so I'll use this again. Think of it as your ballast, your resource, 
uh, to make your system function properly. Last one you'll have to look at is 125-dihydroxy-D. And this is made from 25-OH in a very precision manner in your kidney. And that is a thousand times lower concentration in your blood than this here. But it's a thousand times more biologically active. So this is, you can think of as a precision bullet that's very accurate uh, from this big resource here that you make it from. Okay? That's the three. Now to give a preview of the kind of associations with disease for being low in vitamin D, I'm going to show this first before we get into the evolutionary history. So 32 is generally accepted by the Endocrinological Society in the US and by many other specialists in the field as the minimum comfortable level to be at. So remember 3032. And across here we have your 25 OHD level. And then if you're below 30 but above 20, you're insufficient in vitamin D for full function. So 20 to 30 is not ideal. But below 20, it's called deficiency. Now, you can argue about the semantics. For me, it's all insufficient or deficient below 30. Uh, and similarly for the experts. And what you'll see here is that on the right-hand side, if you're higher in a lot of observational experiments and studies, the higher people in D up to the 40s and 50s saw these kind of percentage reductions in these diseases. So it's pretty substantial. If a drug did that, it would be an enormous blockbuster. Okay? And even in some of the natural experiments shown on this slide, you'll see big reductions where they actually changed the D, knew it was different, and then watch what happened. Okay? So we're talking 50, 60, 70 percent reductions in diseases. So that's just to give a taste so you'll maintain focus later on. Um, what percentage would you say of the US, and likely England and Ireland as well, any northern latitudes where we get poor sources of UBB from the sun, what percentage do you think of the population is insufficient and deficient? 30 percent. Any hands up? 50? Well, oh, 50 percent. Over 70? You probably see where I'm going. This is a few years ago. It'll be worse now. So we have 73%, I believe, are deficient or insufficient in this critical component. And I'll explain later how that happened. Uh, 15 years previously, this distribution was over to the right. Only 50% were deficient or insufficient. So even in 10 or 15 years, we're going right down a bad road. Uh, you can see the people who are above 30 are a relatively small group. If this was an engineering problem and you found a critical component that on your line was set too low and you had quality and yield issues and everything was a malaise, what you would do is you would move up to the known level that was historical where your yield was good and you would tighten the distribution amongst the population of parts and you'd get yourself into this zone. Uh, but that's not really happening with the human population, unfortunately. And we'll talk some more about that. This is just a picture of rickets, uh, 1600s onwards, but mainly in the Industrial Revolution. Uh, children en masse, huge percentages in the cities, were basically getting bow legs. And you can get a lot worse than this, to be honest. These are just sample pictures. Uh, and that's very low. So the vitamin D is low in the mother. The vitamin D transferred to the child is lower. The child is getting no sun vitamin D. Evolution never planned for us not to get sun. It wasn't an intention. Uh, so that's rickets. That's profound. And rickets is coming back in America, particularly in black populations and breastfed children, uh, for reasons I'll describe shortly. Um, and in the UK as well, as I showed. Rickets is back. So the centrality of the sun we'll go through, and I'll explain some of our history. We came from the primates a few million years ago. We became hominids, still hair covered. And in the last million years or so, we evolved into human beings with no hair. We developed striding bipedalism. We're able to do land hunting. Uh, a sweat gland system evolved, where it allowed us to hunt animals over long distances. And the animals would become exhausted because they can only perspire through their mouths, whereas the humans had a huge heat exchanger. Another reason we need this huge cooling system was our brains became massive. And they take a quarter of our calorific uh, needs and the brain must be kept at a precision temperature. You know you're at 37 degrees. If you go to 38 and a bit, you're in a fever. 
Temperature control is critical for the brain. And because the brain will be the same temperature as the arterial temperature throughout the whole body, the whole body needs to be kept cool. So this all evolved for proper reasons. And the reason we got a big brain is we got access to nutrient-dense, rich animal products. And we were able to trade off our digestive freedom, like an ape has a huge belly, small brain, and we were able to go with a small stomach and a big brain. So that's high level. Now, the animals, their skin is generally non-pigmented, um, but the hairless areas are pigmented to protect against intense sun, the equator. So the sun protection is robust. Uh, the vitamin D is accessed, generated in the skin, goes into the fur, and through grooming, the animals get the vitamin D. And that keeps them healthy in the wild. Now, captive animals, it's been seen more and more, need desupplementation because their procreation, they have problems, and they have skeletal problems, and there's a lot of that goes. And some of the experts shown in the picture have helped zoos to actually fix animals, reptiles and all, when their skeletons are kind of falling apart, because this is not well known, or not well known enough. Now, the humans, hair loss, key downside. We had equatorial sun all year round, massive UVB. And the UVB will go through to the blood and damage chemical components that are important in the blood. Uh, through phytholysis. So folate, people are probably familiar, is very important for reproductive success and uh, you get neural tube defects and one of the theories is that the sun would damage folate and cause significant issues there. Not so much the cancer because you, could, you wouldn't get that to later in life, if, even if you got really grilled. And there's other reproductive impacts. Interestingly in the 50s they tried to develop a drug for men which suppressed their folate because they knew it made them less potent. Uh, as a male a fertility drug, but they had to give it up because there were obviously <laughs> other problems that arose from that. But uh, folate, very important for reproductive success, very important early on in evolution in a harsh environment, you know. So anyway, too much sun with lighter skin would be a serious problem. Um, and you also have to protect the sweat gland system because that was pivotal. And when you get sunburned, your sweat glands go crazy. That's a lot of the pain, okay? So what about the synthesis of this critical component if you get intensely dark pigmentation, you know, like equatorial uh, humans? Well, it's so intense, it still gives you enough 25-hydroxy-D. So it's an engineering trade-off with the best engineer in the world doing it, evolution. So I'll show again here, this is your, your pack, your ammo pack. Now, in the last 40k years, and it is debated, somewhere between 20, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 years, which is very short in evolutionary terms, we lost the pigmentation as we migrated north. We had an increasing weakness of UVB, and not only a lower level of UVB, but only a few months of the year was the UVB coming directly down enough from the sun to be very effective. So for seven or eight or nine months as you move north, you won't get bugger all UVB because of the angle of the sun to the earth. So we had to get more vitamin D. So our pigmentation fell away. Now as the sun weakened, we also didn't need as much pigmentation. So this is what happened. In the last 10,000 years as well, you would have clothing increased, which would have contributed because you're getting less sun, less vitamin D. And the adaptive pressure was deployed. Now fishing ability offset a lack of sun in the northern hemisphere. Uh, humans migrated up along rivers and seas and Homo sapiens could fish. They have their encampments, they have fishing implements. The Neanderthals couldn't. <laughs> that might be one of the reasons they went extinct. So, here we have, yes, skin heavily pigmented, works well, you have enough vitamin D, and you have protection. Over here, move north in latitude, studies done with trillions of data points from satellites in the late 1900s correlated the actual UVB available all over the world and tracked it to the indigenous populations and got an excellent correlation with the skin coloration on the inside of the arm which just proves the point. The coloration, the pigmentation loss tracked to the lower UVB in the trade-off sense that I uh, described. Increasing loss of vitamin D synthesis, that's a problem, that's gonna drive evolution. Combined with poor nutrition and tough environments at times, rickets, hip formation problems affecting birth, and a whole lot of what I'm gonna show you later would have selected out. And in 20, 30,000 years, that's a very short evolutionary cycle, you know? So to change from heavily black pigmented through to fully white in only 20 or 30,000 years, as you can imagine, it needs a very strong necessity driver. North hemisphere are very severe. And I'll just acknowledge that some alternative hypothesis tried to say, well, maybe it's not this, that we just lost it because we didn't need it. Uh, and I don't agree. So 
Here we have the evolution from the equatorial homeland and 35,000 years ago up here, 15,000 years ago up here, 10,000 here, and around 50,000 down to Australia. So that just shows the migration uh, of humans from where the UVB was very high. The green is solid UVB all year round. The orange means in winter you've got a lack of UVB, and the red means you've got a fairly heavy lack of UVB around nine months of the year. Uh, that's where we are in America. We've got a lack. Okay. Now here's a guy, very healthy guy. Uh, you'll find in indigenous populations they have excellent teeth, excellent health, because they don't have any modern foods and some things we talked about before. Um, but here's the Maasai here at 42. So remember this 30 figure that I would suggest and the endocrine society would suggest is minimum for humans. They're up at 42 or so. Some people are going way up, over the 60. But a similar tribe that lives in the city with clothing and all other stuff are down actually in the mid-20s. Not a mile off us at our 18 or so average for the population. Okay? Here's Wyoming women, and actually there's males there as well, athletes in hot sun in Wyoming, training. And you'll see the men go up to 42. And 40 is being more and more shown as the level at which the enzymes equilibrate and level off all their activity. So 40 is a good number to remember. But the women actually, in a similar environment, go much higher. And they have a higher average. And that, I would suggest, is relating to lactation. Okay? In general, women go higher in vitamin D for a similar scenario. So here's an experiment came out only a couple of years ago which speaks to this. They got uh, mothers and there is a phenomenon now that the authorities actually state that breast milk is deficient in vitamin D. Now think about that for a moment because this one really got me for a while. Why would breast milk, which everyone says is the best food and it's natural, be sufficient in everything but is insufficient quite profoundly in vitamin D? It's hard to believe, isn't it? What did they do for 50,000 years? How did that happen? Well, this explains it. So they gave mothers 6,400 international units a day, which is a good dose to replace the lost son from our evolution. And the babies, they only breastfed them. And over on the other side, they gave 400, which is like the recommendation for mothers, which doesn't really do anything, but... And they directly gave the baby 300, which is the recommendation, okay? Now, this is at the sixth month you have the vitamin D3 in the blood. Now this is a very rare measurement, it's a research measurement. The measure any of you would get would be the 25 hydroxy made by your liver. But the D3 in the mother's blood here is up at 47. But here, naturally, the D3 is very low, the vitamin presence. And in the six month actually, the women on this side were going out in the sun when they weren't really meant to be for the sake of the experiment. Uh, the previous few months they were only at five and four, and this was still up in the 40s. The mother's 25 hydroxy, her status is 57 here, and here we've got 38 because they've got sun in the last month and they're getting some supplementation. It doesn't look too bad. The baby is getting 46 of the 25 hydroxy, which is healthy. The baby here is getting 43. So these two scenarios work. But look at the mother's milk activity here. Below 400 international units in the milk is deficient. And this mother here, getting an evolutionary boost of vitamin D, is getting 780. This mother's only 140. So that's the reason that breast milk is deficient. Very few people know this, and this is the only time to my awareness it was ever done. They're deficient because the mother is not getting appropriate levels of D. And the appropriate levels by the professor and multiple PhD who did this experiment would be up in the 5,000 for starters, okay? But the guidelines are 400, and I think they've moved to 600 now. What's happening, though, with the baby, why it's okay, is because they've discovered that the mother's D3, not the 25-hydroxy, which everyone measures, the mother's D3 is what transfers to the baby, to the milk, the D3. Only 1% or so of the 25-hydroxy transfers. It doesn't transfer to the breast milk, it's the D3. And the only way to get the D3 up is to have the mother adequate. And that's why breast milk is deficient. Over on this side, we have a poor D3 status and the breast milk is insufficient. But luckily, we're giving it direct to a very low birth weight baby. We're given 300 direct. 
So you overcome the problem of the mother not having enough D, but you must supplement the baby, okay? This is the fifth month of the treatment before these uh, ladies actually got sun and boosted, and there the milk was 620 versus 70, an order of magnitude increase. And in evolution, you would have needed this because you didn't have this, and you got it from the sun primarily. Okay, so I think I've covered that, and that's quite an interesting thing. Now we look a bit more at disease for a moment. So the traditional or evolutionary would have been up above the 30, and you see the bone mineral density in these studies levels out at a high, good level. Colon cancer, fractures, walk time for elderly, attachment loss, all reach their optimum in this range, okay? But here's what the population is, okay? Generally, the bulk of the population is from 12 to 24. That's the problem. And it was discussed was the problem of proof from Robert P. Haney, another fantastic professor who's working 30 years in this field, and a writing paper saying we cannot get through to people with this, okay? So the creation, so we go quite quickly through this to save time. I'd like you to have a feel for how it's created, but I won't labor. Sunlight acting on 7D hydroxycholesterol in your blood. People with higher cholesterol make more D. Um, uh, but the D hydroxycholesterol actually they believe, there's different theories, that it's actually generated in the skin rather than taken from your cholesterol in your uh, system, which is made in the liver. Anyway, it's, um, and sunscreen prevents synthesis. So sunscreen stop all B. Keep that in mind now. Colocalciferol, vitamin D3 is created in your body from the sun on the hydroxycholesterol. You can take supplements and get it well up as well. Very powerful. Diet, I put it in orange because you're not going to get in a modern diet. If you're eating an ancestral diet of organ meats and fish and bones and all that kind of stuff and scooping the marrow out like the campsites of our forebears, you'll get a lot of D. You won't get it down in the supermarket, okay? And in the liver, as I say, this critical vitamin uh, or pre-hormone is made into 25 OHD. And that's the key metric for humans. In the, in the kidney, as I said, 125, the active hormone is made. That's the bullet. And for the 20th century, the science mostly believed it was all around this active hormone. And they were mistaken. It was believed that this active hormone, which is true, was released from the kidney in precise amounts and controlled the calcium homeostasis, how much calcium in the bone, how much is absorbed from the gut. And it does, it does that. But the 21st century, things have changed because now they realize that this 25-hydroxy has a profound effect in each cell. So not the kidney going into the systemic blood system, but in each cell, you can generate the active hormone from your hydroxy. But the amount you do and how well you do will depend on the level of your substrate. Okay? Here we see how the active hormone is linked to a whole range of functions. It's embedded in our system. It's got its fingers in every pie. Vitamin D, they reckon, activates or affects 5 to 10% of our whole genome. Okay? And vitamin D receptors are in the nuclei of nearly every cell in your body, okay? But they believed it was this active hormone, and they used to throw more of that in or less and didn't get great results because they didn't know about what I just told you. All these diseases are associated. This is the new stuff. 25-hydroxy acts in your macrophage and monocytes in your immune system. It acts on breast, colon, and prostate cells and controls cell division and proliferation and autophagy and cell death. It affects your vascular cells through a myriad of functions, your arterial network, smooth muscle cell proliferation, it reduces inflammation, it mediates, it monitors, it acts. So when you see the diseases in the next set of slides, you'll have some idea. And the parathyroid gland, if you're low on D, parathyroid hormone will rise and it's a sign of disease. The way to keep your parathyroid hormone at its minimum level, because it's a bad thing to have high, is to go above 30 in hydroxy. You go below 30 in hydroxy D, your parathyroid hormone will start rising, and that's indicative of problems, okay? Now, the control system criticality, I can't possibly address the complexity of this throughout the system, but I will take one example, and I'll take the example of TB, 
And you know when people got TB, they were sent to the sun. I always thought that was silly. That was rubbish. You know, it's like some kind of shaman stuff. No, it's absolutely true. It's chemistry, it's science, biology. So you have your u unique DNA code, and there's 7 billion of you on the planet, but even if there were 70 billion, you'd all be unique, or 700 billion, because the complexity of your DS DNA is enormous, right? Y you all know that. What you might not know is you have 35 trillion cells approximately in an adult. And every nucleus in every cell has a full copy of your full DNA. So your full, massively complex code that's hard to even imagine, like the biggest library in the world, is replicated 35 million times. It's in every cell. And there's a reason it's in every cell, because it needs to be accessed all the time. Your DNA didn't just make you, it is the code to run your machine. And it is accessed all the time. You even change your diet like we talked about earlier and you eat, say, more fat, less carbohydrate, you'll be going in, unwinding your DNA and writing off proteins that you need to help you digest. So keep that profundity in mind. The 25 OHD crosses the cell membrane, any cell at once. The level you have will mediate the level of what goes on here. On demand, an example I'll take is tuberculosis. When tuberculosis is sensed by the monocytes through troll-like receptors, on your immune system cells, it immediately kicks something into action. It begins to generate 125D in your cells, never even leaves. Remember the 20th century, they were looking at the 125 bullet in the blood? This is different. In each cell, myriad cells, 125D goes into overdrive production. The reason it goes into overdrive when the TB is sensed is it has to link with vitamin D receptor, which is in practically all the cells. This is retinol X receptor, it's, it's a mechanism, don't need to know it. And while this is being created, the molecules of this, it simultaneously creates a dehydroxylase, an enzyme that will destroy the bullet. So it actually creates the bullet to fix the problem. And in the act of creating the bullet, creates the enzyme to dehydroxylase it and pass it out as, as a waste product, safe. That's the profundity here. This conglomerate of the active hormone then, and this is happening immediately when the TB attacks, goes the vitamin D receptor entity on the DNA unwinds the helix of your DNA in the exact section where it needs the code for cathelcidin, which is a biocide the body creates to attack the likes of TB. Okay? Remember your DNA is like the biggest library in the world. This goes into the building out of thousands of buildings, goes into the room, goes into the filing cabinet, goes into the filing drawer, goes into the file and picks out the exact sheet that it needs for cathelcidin and it does it automatically and immediately, okay? It creates a messenger RNA string of code for the specific enzyme needed or protein, and that's transcription. It's happening all the time, all the time. With TB, it'll certainly happen, but it happens with lots of other processes all the time. It also, with the safety switch that was created with the 125, it shuts off the 125 when the job is done. The messenger RNA comes out of the nucleus, across the membrane, into the cytoplasm in the cell, and the factory goes into overdrive. And this will replicate and make a whole load of molecules of cathelcidin. And they will destroy the TB. But it's a shock and awe type thing because if you make a few of these molecules and you mess around with the TB, the TB can get entrenched in your body. You know, gramolase or I forget what they're called. And once it's entrenched, you can no longer get to it. Then you need a different thing. But in the first stage of TB, you can overpower with cathelcidin. And that's why sun fix TB or stop people getting it. That's replication. And this is just one mechanism of many by which D is profound. And I just wanted to show one to give a feeling for it. Okay? Just giving you an idea here, experiments, this 2007 immunolo immunology uh, journal, very interesting. They increased from no 125 in cellular media, moved it up, and the cathelcidin is accordingly produced. More, one, more 25 hydroxy, more 125, more cathelcidin, more shock and awe, more chance of walking away from it. Okay? Also, you can see with the 125 increasing, the safety switch is increased, the enzyme to take away the bullet. All automatic. This is the tip of the iceberg of the complexity of the human system. And it's been underestimated and not realized really until the last decade, this mechanism. Similar for your auto adaptive immune system, through T cells, the same kind of thing. Incredible stuff, but we're not gonna go through it today. 
So the consequences, so now you've seen the history and you've seen some of the importance of it and you've actually seen some of the mechanisms by which it works, which to be honest still blow me away. Love them. So let's look at the consequences of low D. And I'll start off with epidemiological or associative type studies. Now these look at a population and you find out, hey, the people with cancer, they're much more lower D people. It doesn't prove the lower D caused it though, okay? But it's still, when you add it to the mechanisms, it's a very strong buildup of proof. But afterwards we look at experiments where we switched it on and switched it off. Well, not me. Guys who do this stuff. Okay, so here's heart and general morbidity. And I have tons of these on my thumb drive. I'm just going to show one or two. They all say the same thing. You can see in the population that 65% were low in D. And that's natural because every, every population you're going to look at, you're going to see 65% are low. Um, but these are the guys who are in and they have issues. So they looked at the survival over six or seven years in this study of a whole bunch of people. The people over 30, that's how quickly they died. 16 to 30, faster, and then below 16. Remember the 30 magic number, much faster death rate. And to be honest, these kind of survival curves, because I've studied smoking um, etiology a little bit, uh, are reminiscent of smoker versus non-smoker. So that's a good kind of reference. A lot of these graphs you'll see, the difference in disease, it's kind of difference between a heavy smoker and a non-smoker. We'll give you an idea, scale, right? Because everyone knows about that. Okay? Remember D is a proxy for sun. So the high D people will tend to have got more sun. So the benefits of the sun that are only being understood now beyond D, they'll have had that too. So just keep that in mind, it might not be all D. Okay? Here's coronary vascular mortality and all cause, another study, again, there are many. The journals are full of them. This is 2011. And they're all squabbling over whether it's causal or not. I would say just get everyone up to 35 nanograms and look what happens and then see who's right. But anyway, they won't because of safety concerns of giving D supplements, which are based, unfortunately, on a lot of bad science many decades ago. Okay? So here we see the lowest quartile of D and the figures speak for themselves. You'll see this all over the place. And even, not only is there a dose-response relationship, which also speaks to cause, it's another bit of evidence towards cause if you get an incremental dose-response, lower, more death, uh, but the lowest quartile peels away from the bunch. You know? So anyway, there's tons of this. Uh, here's colon cancer, very strongly linked to vitamin D. You can see there, P equals 0.0001 a practically dead linear relationship with higher D being associated with lower risk of colon cancer. Again, not proven cause, but all the mechanisms for D speak to the immune system and cell proliferation, right? Here's colon cancer mortality. Very large study, NHANES cohort, 2000. Below 20 nanogram, 20 to 32 nanogram, the magic over 32, 75% less mortality related to being above 32. They're still squabbling, but that's the reality. Breast cancer, again, it has links to colon cancer and the kind of the nature of the disease. Uh, again, the linear relationship. Here they uh, had higher D people up to 50 and 60. But remember, you're going to have loads of those in the mass eye anyway. It's not that amazing to be up at 50 or 60. Uh, but the linear relationship and the 50% lower risk happens to coordinate with 48 nanograms here. Again, linear relationship, really good p-values. Here's another study. Again, there's lots of them. Um, same thing, seen every time. Here with 52 nanograms, some of the studies show 36. You know that is noisy, so it'll vary. Breast cancer specifically looking at mortality, given that someone has it. Again, the D above 25 nanograms here versus below. That's a risk nominally of one. This is near enough 75% lower risk. Keeps happening. That's 2007. All of these reports in the last decade, pretty much. You won't see any of this before 2000. Um, multiple sclerosis. So this is an autoimmune disease where your body's immune system that's meant to attack but not attack itself. In multiple sclerosis, the immune system goes overboard and attacks the myelin sheets in your neurons. And it takes away the insulation, really, in your nerve system. And then there's crosstalk. These smile curves exist for most diseases. And the smile curves are at the latitude of zero, where you have lots of UVB that generates vitamin D. These diseases just peel away to nothing. 
And as you go up north in latitude and south in latitude, you get higher inc er, increments. Ireland's up here, 53 degrees north. That's quite north, and that's our rate up there, around 100 for 100,000. It's been rising for the last 30 years, and you've probably heard it's more of an issue now than before, right? Multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, autoimmune diseases, asthma, all of these things. Some of it's what we eat. We are eating absolute trash. There is no doubt about that, and it has an impact. A lot of it relates to this. Okay? Multiple sclerosis 2013, the Neurology Disorders uh, Journal. Here you have the genetics. They have got genetic particular makeups that mean people are more prone. But then over here, true life, we've got the environmental factors that they know are critical. They've only got three. Most of the environmental that they talk about between getting MS or not getting MS is sun exposure in childhood. This is a given. This is established. Sun exposure, the mother's sun exposure, birthday in autumn when the mother in the last trimester had high D, lower risk for MS. Frequent outdoor activities, vitamin D sufficiency, 25 above 100 nanomole, that's 40 nanogram, okay, 40 nanogram, not 30, 40. And we've got uh, MS then, no outdoor activities, vitamin D insufficiency, uh, birthday in spring, insufficient vitamin D in the mother's pregnancy, all tied down. These guys who are the specialists, there's no question. They've got smoking in there is a small factor, and Epstein-Barr virus they've linked in as well. So there are some other factors, but it's mostly vitamin D and sunshine exposure. So I'll show, you, I'll show you an experiment for that. This is a case-controlled experiment. Doesn't necessarily prove cause, but you look at a bunch of people with multiple sclerosis, and you take a bunch of people who mirror them exactly, but they don't have it. You keep get the same kind of racial profile, same age, same stuff. Um, it's a good experiment. They tracked very accurately the exposure they got um, of sunshine, and there's the risk. The lowest sunshine is nominal for multiple sclerosis of one, a risk of one, and then lower risk with increasing sunshine exposure. They then measured the actinic damage in their skin. So if you didn't believe these guys and what they were telling you, maybe they said, oh, I got a lot of sun, and they didn't. Well, you can measure in a high-powered microscope qualities of the skin that show how much sun was received over the years. And they got a much stronger relationship. Okay? Because you can't always trust grilling people, questioning them. Multiple sclerosis is largely a disease mediated by lack of sun exposure. And it was the age of 6 to 10 and 10 to 16, but they didn't do below 6. It's important back there, believe me, and it's important in pregnancy. Um, after the age 16, the amount of sun you get doesn't matter as much anymore. You know? So people who come from a very sunny climate and they leave it at the age 16 and they go to a non-sunny one, they actually retain their low risk for life of multiple sclerosis. And sadly, people who come from a poor sun environment to a good one don't actually really get the benefit of low risk because it's encoded in your adaptive immune system by vitamin D from conception through to early adulthood. P01s again, unsurprisingly. Okay, now I'm going to go through the consequences, but we'll switch to experimental, which is more powerful in a way because you switch on and off the factor, give people more D, give them less D. It's kind of unethical with D as far as I'm concerned because giving people low D, in my mind, is bordering on unethical. Interestingly, the ethics committee, committees won't let you give high D just in case. They're wrong. It's low D. That's the unethical thing. But here we go. This was a well-constructed <coughs> experiment in 2007 by Professor Heaney and team. And they gave 1,200 women nearly, and they were at 29 nanograms per mil. So they didn't start off like they were in the toilet in vitamin D, you know? They were reasonable in vitamin D. And they gave them 1,100 international units, which is a dose you might say will do something. To be honest, it's low. I would have given them four or 5,000. but. Um, 1,100 they gave, and they gave calcium. And I'm not going to get into calcium today, but it's synergistically interactive with vitamin D in a profound way, but we limit the scope. And they followed them for four years, five years, actually. And they took out the first year's cancers, because in the first year, if you start doing something and supplementing people, if they get cancer a month or two later, it's hardly likely due to the supplement. So they take out the first year to clean the data. And they looked at the following four years. Calcium and vitamin D supplement, there's the mortality fall off. 99% still alive, approximately. 
calcium only because it has effects that are important too. And here's the placebo, the people who didn't get anything. And they're down 94%. So the upshot of it is the relative risk in this smallish experiment, but properly done with reasonable levels of D given, and the guys not getting the D weren't allowed to go off and take D. The whole thing would have been a mess. You won't believe how many experiments were done like I've just described. They give 400 units of D to one side, and they allow both sides of the experiment to take as much D as they want. They get a result that shows nothing. It gets published all over the place. This D is overrated. Influenza. Influenza, here is in 1958 when people were better off in D. You can see during the winter you go way down in 25-hydroxy. This sinusoidal cycle of going up and down in vitamin D and being low in general is an experiment of evolution because we only 30,000 years ago went away from full UV all year round. So it's not just the lower levels we have, we have a sinusoidal. And that's been hypothesized compellingly, particularly by a professor Veith, who gives an excellent lecture on YouTube about it, as that's part of the problem, is the sinusoidal variation in the physiology. But anyway, this is what happens everyone, unless you supplement. Me, <coughs> me for instance, I'm going to stay flat. I'm not a 26 either, more like 40, <laughs> like my forebears. But most people, this is what's happening. And they have hypothesized, and I agree with them, that influenza is not a normal uh, disease like, say, Ebola or certain colds that it's mediated by vitamin D. So when the population goes down low in vitamin D at certain times of the year, the natural defenses are down, the carriers of various uh, strains then break out and you pass it around. And there are many bits of data for this and it's been talked about for 50, 60 years. And I, th I think they're correct. The latitude simultaneously, flu can break out at the same level of latitude all over the world, unconnected even before there was a lot of travel. There's transfer dynamics for diseases. They can mathematically model diseases and put constants on them. And all they need to do is go to houses, schools, factories, find out who got it when, and you can mathematically model the disease and how it'll spread. You can do it for all spreadable diseases. Can't do it for flu. There is no constant. You can't calculate it, because it doesn't behave. It doesn't behave. So basically, I'd say it's mediated. And during the 1918, uh, the massive flu outbreak, you had sailors that had way lower mortality rates than the soldiers in the hold. They were exposed to sun all the time. D would have been high. And during the summer, the flu would just disappear. And the guys in the trenches and everything would be fine. And then the winter would come in. They'd start falling like flies again. There's a huge amount of evidence for this. It's not a popular idea because it doesn't fit in very well with a lot of our modern vaccine structures and such like. But anyway, so let's look at an experiment. Here first we'll see the, uh, just to look at re respiratory infections, 1958 in the birth census. Here is your vitamin D going way up to the 30 during the summer and falling off. Here's the respiratory illnesses recorded accurately in the hospitals. It's even got the slight dwell angle behind the fall in vitamin D where the disease rises intimately linked, and all the mechanisms are there as well. The only thing that's missing is the experiment that proves it. But there is one. There's another one or two as well, but they're not done so well. This was done with giving vitamin D to people in hospitals over a three-year period. A couple of hundred individuals randomized nicely. Placebo was placebo, and the placebo guys were not getting vitamin D. It's a proper experiment, rare one. 800 international units a day, which is probably, it'll help a lot. And in the final year, they jumped them to 2,000, because I think they got excited. Here's what they saw. The placebo guys went down like a sack of stones in the winter with the flu. The other guys didn't go down at all. Also, as I said, the placebo guys didn't have any flu in the summer and the spring and the autumn. And their vitamin D was reasonable levels. There it is. The 2,000 guys in the final year didn't even show up anywhere except here. One guy got something in the summer. So that's the experiment. Obviously, this experiment should have been done around 50 times by now, but unfortunately, no one's been doing the experiments. So 25 OHD acts, multiple mechanisms as discussed, and very few studies done. And even some studies that were done on mice, rats, and dogs, they lacked a vitamin D receptor for this activity. They're different than humans, so the data doesn't mean much. I'll final, 
finalize with a slide, and I can pick any number of these out here from prestigious journals. And it's largely known. It acts all through life in a profound way, from placenta right through and the mother status. Even DNA methylation, DNA replication, the whole lot. So, I was going to get into now the anatomy of the debacle. How, how did we end up with the whole population down in the toilet and getting worse every year? We look at that. Here's another quick flash again of the population. This is 98 to 94. The percentage of people who are above 30. And you can see these darker bars here. Not too bad. Uh, certain races have more difficulty because with darker skin you need a lot more sun to get the same level of D. And the lighter bars are 10 years later, roughly. The percentage of people above 30 has roughly halved in only 10 or 12 years. So is it any wonder that all the diseases associated with D are going up? This diagram here shows that 2012, a very irate doctor um, wrote Understanding the Panacea of the Sun, effectively understanding what I've just gone through. Um, and the dogma, there's a load of dogma around it. Oh, calcium can be toxic, and if we give too many D supplements, they can be toxic, right? Rubbish, but anyway. There was one guy years ago, and he got two million units a day because he had the wrong bottle, and it was super concentrated. Two million units a day for months, and he presented with kind of problems. They discovered what it was, stopped taking it, recovered fully. There's another doctor who took three million a day for several weeks, just to prove the point. There is toxicity. But below 30,000 units a day, there is no evidence of toxicity. No evidence. And you'll get 10,000 units in half an hour in the sun in the summer. You get 10,000 units. It's incredible. But anyway, we'll get back on point. This diagram here shows the profound nature of the sun through the eye, the retina, to the pineal gland, which controls all your hormones. Through the UVB wavelength of around 290 to 300, creates vitamin D, which acts on all the systems and all of this profound nature of the sun, right? And even the visible light it affects on the skin and causes other components to change, right? It's part of our makeup. We evolved with it, right? But that diagram you pulled from 1988, <laughs> you know? And I showed you the distribution. How the hell are we down here when every bit of credible evidence, and I've summarized some of it there, says we should be up here? And that's a why question. So I'll give you one of the reasons why. There's probably a few, and some of them are more controversial. They relate to, well, money. But I'll give you one that's interesting. The skin cancer melanoma hysteria. How many people here know that when you get more sun, you have more chance of getting cancer and dying? Yeah. Of course. It's obvious, because we've been told it for 40 years. There's no way anyone could be wrong for 40 years. Oh, oops, they were wrong about fat being bad. It was the carbon. OK. Well, they shouldn't be wrong too often. So I'll show you. Blue, and again, all those professors who've spent a career working in vitamin D are cognizant of this too. And I got a couple of them to review this material, and it included this bit. This bit should uh, be interesting. Blue is the UVB zone that enables vitamin D synthesis. It's only 10 or so nanometers. It is precise, it is critical, and evolution has been doing it for hundreds of millions of years in this narrow range. Red is the zone that enables tan protection. This UV wavelength that makes the vitamin D also triggers uh, the melanin to be produced. And the melanin that's produced will actually move in your cell to be between the sun and the nucleus. And if you move the cell sideways, the melanin will migrate to shield the nucleus. This is profound stuff, not the rubbish that comes from humans over the decades of misunderstandings, OK? Now, Green is the, oh, by the way, the red is the zone also that causes erythema, which is sunburning. And that's evolution's kind of way of telling you to back off. So you don't want to get sunburned. Don't mistake me here. Don't want to get sunburned. I'm going to get a lot of healthy sun, don't want to get sunburned. The green is the zone that theoretical modeling from mice and that suggests cosmetic skin cancers. Now, I'm saying cosmetic, and I don't mean to understate it. But that's what the people in the field call them. Mm. And the reason is because the skin cancers here basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas are less than half a percent mortality. They're so curable that they're treated as cosmetic. And when I go out looking for reports and studies of them, I can't find any really, because no one bothers studying them, right? 
I didn't know this. My father got skin cancer when he was 72. I said, geez, I said, you got skin cancer? And I said, oh, God, you know, on his head. He was, he was on boats years ago. Uh, and he said, ah, oh, no, it doesn't matter. It's just, they just cut it out with a plaster on. So if you find it early, it's trivial. It's part of getting old, in a sense. That's skin cancers, squamous and basal cell. <sighs> UVA, however, is 95% plus of the energy that comes from the sun. And that is associated cutaneous malignant melanoma, which is the third skin cancer. That is a very different animal, okay? Very different. That is serious. UVA sails through ozone. Not a bother. Those wavelengths, no problem. They'll even go through glass. Ozone stops a good bit of this, and glass stops it completely. These just pour down all the time, okay? And they're the ones that are linked to melanoma. They got mice years ago, actually. Gave them a lot more UVA, got way more melanoma. Okay, so these skin cancers associated with the UVB, the UVB gives us vitamin D, which is anti-cancer, anti-cell uh, oncogene, all that stuff, right? Fundamental for health, and vitamin D, and gives you the burning reaction that gets you out of all the sun, including UVA, right? That's a good thing. And it gives you the tanning, and the melanin that tans because of the UVB cuts out the UVA as well. It's the way. That's why black people, you know, obviously have a huge amount of melanin. They don't have any problem because they can shut out the UVA. But the sunscreens for decades were very effective at cutting out B because it's easy. You can stop that stuff with a bit of tissue paper. They didn't have any UVA protection, the sunscreens, for decades. They didn't understand it in fairness. I suppose they were selling a lot of them. Not effective. Even now you'll hear those multi-spectrum. Very hard to stop UVA. There is no proper measure of the multispectrum exactly how much UVA is stopping. It's very difficult. It's easy to stop UVB. But UVB brings in a lot of good, way more good than bad. UVA, pretty much all bad. So that's a problem. And uh, here's a melanoma victim study. Uh, there's lots of these, by the way. This is not the only one. There are many, and they all say the same thing. Healthy sun exposure measured in large cohorts, melanoma versus non-melanoma people, more sun recorded, lower risk of melanoma. Not skin cancer, but remember that's more cosmetic, it's not such a big issue. I'll show you one quick thing here, less than 0.5% mortality, around 2,000 deaths a year in the US. This is 9,000 deaths a year. I get this, I'm not worried, get it early, get it looked after. This, different matter. Okay, so here's melanoma, this is the real skin cancer. More sun exposure, lower risk. This is known by the specialists in the field. Lower sun, or more sun in holiday exposure, because they question them in every level, <coughs> lower risk. More sun 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. In northern latitudes, that's the time when you have the most UVB relative to UVA. So you're getting more UVB relative to UVA. So a shorter time in midday sun gets you a lot more UVB and less UVA. A lot more time in the afternoon sun, you've got a higher proportion UVA, and there are papers, and I've gone through them, that talk about the UVB-UVA ratio. It's extremely important. But that's why this happens. Strong correlation to OHD, but not complete correlation, but very strong. And the effect of more sun being better, even applied to the skin types that are more prone, which is kind of a paradox. Many studies. The real risk factors accepted now are Significant sun burning incidents were never intended. The UVA goes down deep into your epidermis and under it causes radical oxygen species and indirectly damages DNA quite severely. The UVBA causes DNA damage, but it triggers the response to repair, triggers the vitamin D, and it triggers the tanning reaction. The UVA just goes in and causes real damage. Okay? So significant sun burning incidents, you overpower your system with all that UVA coming pouring into deep levels. Uh, so they are associated. Some studies actually associate more burning with less melanoma even then, but it's very noisy, but it's accepted it's the burning. And light skin, freckles, red hair, propensity to burn in this massive study was um, a higher risk. There's no doubt. Propensity to burn and getting burnt is a problem but it's not the sun per se, and this subtlety is known by relatively few. Sunscreens, a lot of studies on this, they all, you probably heard them from the media the odd time. Sunscreen use repeatedly is getting associated with melanoma. I've just explained the mechanism to you. 
many, many studies, and that's what precipitated the multi-spectrums. I've even seen ads for sunscreens that actually shout from the page, hey, we're able to stop the UVA, that really gives you cancer. They're actually advertising the point. But still, most, the vast majority of people won't understand this. So always use sunscreen, higher melanoma in case control studies, and even when they corrected for exposure frequency, skin type, duration, social status, income, and try to correct for anything else that might be falsely saying this. No. More sunscreen use. You shut out the UVB, you shut out the vitamin D, you shut out the tanning reaction, and generally speaking, you let the UVA wide open to generate profoundly damaging molecules deep in your skin that will damage your DNA. Okay? And in this report, it was a British report from 2000, very extensive, really good team, went through just all of what I've told you. And there's hundreds of these. There's even an FDA group, study group, 2010, released a report on a hypothesis around melanoma. And they actually just accept that the sunscreen problem, they know about this one that I've told you, but they're also looking at people inside windows have no UVB and they're getting all the UVA. And they built a whole hypothesis around that indoor, oh, ex, outdoor workers, always, everywhere, lower melanoma than indoor workers, always. That's been known for decades. Okay, so that's a problem. And again, here, lots of papers around this, and it was even in the news there, 2010. But most people read these things and they don't have a clue what to do with them. The paper says fat's bad, it says it's good. It says you get sunscreens give you cancer, sunscreens stop it. Unfortunately, it's not people's fault. You can't. You can't get the chafe from the wheat. Okay, but I've explained it to you. Bottom line, and this is the last bit of data, and then we'll just move on, and I'll just see how I'm doing on time, or battery even. Okay, so Swedish women, big study, came out in March this year, and I already was aware of what I'd already talked about there, or a good bit of it, and then I saw the study, and I thought, oh, nice one. They were doing a melanoma study just probably to prove what I just told you, and they looked at sun exposure, but they saw a lot more than melanoma. 30,000 Swedish women 20 years ago and they tracked the amount of sun exposure they were getting. And yeah, they looked at melanoma, but when they wrote the report, they mainly talked about all-cause mortality because they weren't interested in the melanoma when they saw the all-cause. The ones in the upper quartile of active sun exposure had half the mortality 20 years later. Now think about that for a minute. Half the mortality over 20 years is an enormous measure. And you can see the graph here. The upper sun exposure, the middle, this must have been third tiles, and the lower. And that's the fall off of dying. And it's 15 year shown here. Clear as day. And even throughout life, the mortality differences were seen, not just when they all got very old, but there was a full age cohort. All the way, halved. This applied after adjusting for comorbidity. They tried to see, well, are the people who get less sun, maybe they're they're sick. Or, no. They adjusted for medicans, medicines they were taking, comorbidity factors, just for smoking, education, income, disposable income. Maybe the guys who get more sun are richer, right? This is the excuse you hear. They adjusted for it and accounted for it. Didn't make any difference. The name of the report is, in 2014, avoidance of sun exposure is a risk call factor for all-cause mortality. Results from the melanoma in southern Sweden cohort. And there's a lot of talk about this, but you won't see it in the papers. You'll see it if you're going through the journals. Dose-response relationship seen throughout. 25 is cited, definitely they see rela uh, related to 25-hydroxy-D. But again, there are other benefits of the sun that maybe in six or eight months I might give a talk on. Cholesterol, sulfate, mineral management, and then a lot more profound mechanisms that are switched on by sun and relate to your health. But we won't talk about them now because I haven't studied them. Okay. So I'll stop. Actually, I'll just show one more slide. This one I only got last night. I was looking through just collated journals and just seeing what final material I'd used. And I found this. And uh, it's actually, I read it up, it's true. A veterinary uh, give a lot more D3, animal world D3, uh, <coughs> to their lambs than we give to humans. Uh, the feed for lambs is advertised as being high in D3 for successful growth, disease, all this stuff and they had 10x the dose in the lamb feed. So in veterinary world, they simply go and do what makes sense. Whereas it appears in the human world, we agonize over levels. Anyway, debacle. So we'll go on to, um, 
here the low, and this might speak to your point there, there's no magic fixes, but there's a semi-magic fix that is accepted by the people who work in the field and its supplementation. So below 32 nanograms per mil is worldwide agreed to be insufficient. It's not too controversial. Um, and that's where the exposure is. Uh, high vitamin D has some evidence, but limited, and nothing you could quote, that being particularly high, especially if you're low in K2, which is another very important vitamin, and it works with D, um, you could perhaps have excessive calcification. But I'm only saying that to show that there may be an upper bound. And the center is healthy sun exposure, not going out and burning, um, fat nutrient dense diet will help, oily fish, cod, liver, pate, all these things just are things that have D in them, uh, and correct D3 supplements properly applied. So I'm not gonna say anything about supplements. There's a GP in the area, an MD, who's highly cognizant of this, and I would leave it to him to talk about supplements. I'm only talking here about the science, okay? And that range of 32 to 50 is being accepted by the best in the field now as the evolutionary range and the appropriate range, okay? And also adequate calcium, vitamin K2, and vitamin A, which you won't go into much detail here, but I just wanted to acknowledge that it's not just D. D just happens to be one of the major actors in the drama. All right? Um, an epilogue really, and again, I wasn't gonna go through this, but just to give people a flavor, all this talk of vitamins and supplements, I always thought was blarney, you know what I mean? Just eat reasonable food and you'll be okay. But since studying it and knowing some of the biochemistry, they are important. Calcium is important to get. It works with D in terms of forming your skeletal structure and it forms in your blood pressure. It crosses cell boundaries to change pressure inside and outside the cell. And I'm beginning to realize more that actually this stuff really does matter. Part of the confusion is when you do bad experiments and give calcium in the wrong dose and you don't control them properly, you get back rubbish. But I believe that calcium, when properly taken in, in along with vitamin K2 and vitamin A and your D status correct, that all of them together will be synergistic. So I just wanna make the point, it's not just D, probably to your point, John, actually, it's not just magic D, it's a mixture of things. But for today, it's to get an understanding of D's history, its mechanisms, and some of its implications. It's generally accepted now that get healthy sun in the summer. Uh, the winter, you're not gonna get it. So supplement in the winter with animal world, cola calciferol D3. And then take out the sinusoidal relationship that you have with D and get it more leveled out at an appropriate level. And that's ultimately it. And as I say, I've given the name of an MD who has studied this and many other things actually, and is somewhat of an expert in them himself. So good guy to talk to. You will see a lot of ancestral foods on, in here. You won't see a whole lot of packaged foods. <laughs> uh, and it will have a tendency towards certain things like highly nutritious foods like eggs and you know, meats and butters. And Natto's an interesting one for K2. It's fermented bean curd, but the bacteria make the K2. It's an animal world vitamin that's very, very important. Uh, but you can get it from plant sources if they were fermented. So again, I'm not going to go into any detail here, but it's probably just to show there's more beyond the D. So any other questions generally on D then? Would you simply be selling portions of those food at a low with sugar or something? <laughs> I'm, I'm not getting into the food end of it, no. Uh, I'll stick to the science. But um, hopefully it gave you an idea of a world that's out there that actually has anyone here any real grasp before this, besides talking to me in the last six months, of this whole arena? I'm aware they've given vitamin D supplements to pretty much all newborn babies now in the last couple of years. Yeah. We missed that. And uh, let's just say that some of the passion you may have sensed in my talk relates to that, because my mother, all of them gave baby uh, vitamin D, and particularly if you're breastfeeding, as you see. And my youngest son has a malformed a uh, femur uh, that actually they don't know exactly what causes, it's Perthes disease. It's not necessarily associated with vitamin D, but when he was three, he had a lot of asthma, asthma, a lot of issues, kind of very sickly child, the fifth child. And I found out since that 100% breastfeeding for five children, that can tend to happen in the later children. They are lower on D. Um, we brought him to the hospital uh, when he was three and they told us he was D deficient. 
they highlighted it. I didn't know what it meant. So my wife got the bottle and gave him some drops and probably didn't even do what we should have done. Um, and in my mother's day, we all got the drops. I mean, that's what happened. And now you're right. They're back to doing the drops. But there's 20, 30 years in between where there's a bit of a wasteland. So yeah, it's tough stuff. But you're right. They're doing it now, but they're not doing nearly enough. Uh, but yeah, they are doing, doing it. One of the things you mentioned there was like, by the time you're age 16, you can, you know, you were saying you have a, a, an increased risk later on in life, but it, mm. it's more or less encoded by the time you're 16. So mm. the supplementation after that, does that counteract the fact that if you haven't had enough? It depends. Oh yeah, no, that's right. it depends on the disease. So what's accepted is that the 0 to 16 years for MS and type 1 diabetes, I believe, the encoding of your autoimmune system is able or enabled and made very good by D. So if you're low, it's more important to have D supplementation below 16 years old for those autoimmune diseases and multiple sclerosis is specific. It will also be beneficial later if you actually have the disease but in a less profound way. Because like cancer, if you get cancer and you stop eating sugar, that's gonna really help. Some of the best oncologists in the world now are putting people on ketogenic diets, ultra low carb, to treat cancer. But when you've already got cancer, doing the right thing isn't as powerful as if you did the right thing all along. You know, and there is no trial. This is the thing that kills me. There is no trial, and I would love to do one, you wouldn't even be allowed to do it anymore. And let someone eat a high grain, high carb diet, you know, and let their vitamin D just be what it is in the population, right? Let them eat the omega-6 vegetable oils, right? And not eat the omega-3, and compare them over 20 years to a group that gets their D up to evolutionary levels, that eats an appropriate, moderated carb diet, no sugar, and has an omega-6, omega-3 ratio. So they're the three big pillars of health and they've never been tested together. 40, 50 years has tested a ton of stuff and a lot of it's rubbish as we talked about last time. So that would be an amazing experiment. But a lot of us now in certain communities are doing that experiment every day. Uh, and Dr. Davis, one of the leading progressive cardiologists in the States, no longer really uh, operates. He used to operate hundreds of times a year. He's gone into preventative. In the last six or seven years, the three things I mentioned to you, when he gets heart attack patients coming in, they are immediately on a low carb diet, ultra vitamin D supplementation, and low omega-6 vegetable oil, high omega-3 fish oil. Three things. And he said two plus two plus two adds up to 15 there. And he said, I don't have repeat heart attacks. There are people who want to keep smoking, so anyway, I just thought I'd throw out three pillars there. Synergistic. But D's a big one. It's a big one. Ivor, where did you offer a guideline of what does come from? Um, the Institute of Medicine has come out and they, in the States and they've looked at the literature. Uh, I don't agree with them and the endocrinologists and professors here wouldn't agree with them. But they changed from the kind of recommended from 400 to 600, which I still think is ridiculous. Um, but they also said the upper safe limit, the kind of the upper you should ever take, they moved up to 4,000. So it's kind of a mixed message. They're kind of saying that the population, and it's a joke there, how can I go home here? It's probably work on home for a moment. Where do we have the population? They're kind of saying they're kind of okay with this. <laughs> and they're saying that 20 is probably enough because you don't have any bone problems and rickets. And they're saying this stuff out here isn't proven. So we'd rather just stay on the low side. So a lot of the professors here that I've watched their lectures, you can sense the tension. And I've actually adopted some myself, particularly from personal experience, because I think from an engineering standpoint, it's an absurdity. Because the toxic limit is at least 30,000. At least 30,000. 10,000 is a given from the experts is fine a day. But you only need to take a few thousand but they're recommending 600. And you would need several thousand a day to shift that distribution. Four or 600 is, is barely gonna budge that. And 4,000? Yeah, 4,000 a day is what I take during the winter. I mean, it does doctors, I have a network of doctors worldwide now, and one of them said to me, basically, he knows this stuff, he just gives 4,000 as a given during the winter. Um, and he occasionally checks them, just to make sure they're not going up silly high. But he just gives 400 as a default in the winter, or 4,000, sorry, 4,000. I think the 
supplements you find, the highest I have seen is 4,000. And actually, my doctor has recommended me on 5,000 in the short term. Five short. International units. To be honest, 1,000 international units is only 25 micrograms. So even the units in this have confused the field. 5,000 sounds like a lot. It's 125 micrograms. You could take 1,000 milligrams of calcium, and it sounds kind of OK, or 200 milligrams. This is the killer. Even the units have confused this picture. So I, yeah, I'd say a few thousand is the basic dose in the winter in northern latitudes. That's it. That's the data. Then 600. It'll get, if you're really frankly deficient in the toilet in D, you will get more 25 OH for a small amount of D3 because your body will scavenge every molecule of that D3 and that speaks to the importance of being high in 25 hydroxy. You actually, I have studies I wouldn't get into here, they're a bit complex, where they have gone in and they have shown that even the enzymatic dynamics, that when you reach 40 nanograms OHD, that is the knee in the curve where your body actually reaches equilibrium. And after that, it doesn't go any higher. You could set the nanograms for humans just by looking at the enzymatic curves. And you just look at where the body levels off, optimizes, and after that, there's no more. And that's 42 in, the, in a very big study. And the professor who did it, a great guy, very passionate, he personally did thousands of measurements and oversaw every measurement because of the 30 years of confusion around D. And he realized that he will be challenged on this because for some reason the world wants people to stay down around 20. I couldn't imagine why, but he just made sure everything was done perfect. And it's in three different enzymatic measurements of phase reactions, um, 40 nanograms was always where the D3 level, the 25 hydroxy level, and multiple levels, and the calcium at that level is perfectly fine in the urine, even up to much higher even. So there's a vast amount of science and association data which you saw and tentative experimental data proving that D is enormously important. And we have a population here, yeah? And it's frustrating. But anyway, it'll maybe get fixed over time, but at least you have the option of speaking to your medical professional and deciding amongst yourselves what you would like to do. I know what I'll do, the whole family. Okay, any other questions or will we? Oh yeah. I would a basic blood test show where you rely on that blood. Absolutely. Uh, if you just get a standard blood panel, just ask for 25 OHD, don't let them do 125, because that's a test for nephrologists, kidney cancer, oncologists. Uh, I mentioned it, I 70% of doctors in the States recently have been ordering the wrong test. And the 125 test is meaningless because even if your 25 OHD is low and it's a problem, your body will make bloody sure you have enough of the 125. So it's a completely different test. And what is the measurement that they come back with? Now, I will say nanograms per, let's go back to the end. I'll just let it fly away. Nan just on the blood test, it is worth asking for it specifically because most yes. people Oh yeah, sorry, actually, yeah, unfortunately, and it, it probably speaks to this talk or even, most GPs won't be thinking too much about D. They'll be thinking about osteoporosis in old people. Ironically, my mother and her friends, a lot of them are into the D thing. Because older people, <laughs> it's, yeah, but older people are aware that D is important for osteoporosis. So they actually get supplementation. Tragically, the infants, the pregnant mothers, aren't. So, um, but they are, they're getting supplemented. Uh, I'll just, nanograms per mil is the units I'm using because most of the research papers are in those. Uh, you will see nanomoles per liter and it's 2.5 times higher. Um, oh, there was rather a lot. Sorry about that, chaps. You have to put up a lot there. Um, I'll just go down to the, oh, look at all that dreadful stuff. Yeah. Oh, anyway. Um, yeah, so here it is. So 32 to 50 nanograms per mil would be accepted as a good range, and that would be, um, let me see, 80 to 125 nanomoles. So it's 2.5x. So you get an nmol per liter, divide by 2.5 to get the units I've been talking about. If you get nanograms per mil, well then, it's the 30 to 50 kind of range. Mm. Yeah, I think it's between around the 50 nanomoles is the, is the low mark. 
50 nanomoles is 20 nanograms. Below that, you're frankly deficient. Yeah. yeah. And then from 20 to 30, you're insufficient. I just call it a spectrum of woe, to be honest, from everything I've studied, basically. I, I think you, when you were talking about your three pillars there as well, did, did mm. you hear a bit of a swipe at omega-6? Well, excessive omega-6, it competes in the enzymatic pathways with omega-3 and similar pathways. So excessive omega-6 versus omega-3, there's a lot of that, the ratio. So moderate in the omega-6 and more. But no one wants to eat fish anymore, you know. We used to eat a lot of fish, and that's where the omega-3 would be boosted. And then the ratio, even in people's cellular um, construction, the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 over the last 20 or 30 years has gone up from you know, three or four to one, up to 20, 30, 40 to one, and in the foods as well. And nature never intended that to happen, you know. Evolution can't predict us lot and our processed food industry. Is there a test for that ratio? Really no, that would be one that you just follow eating a, a, a good diet of wholesome food and uh, with omega-3 and not. I know a guy personally who, who had advanced heart disease at 52 and he was in the top 10% of fitness on a treadmill and he thought he was you know, bulletproof. He's actually like made a documentary and a film about this, about heart disease. And he's treated directly by Dr. Davis, who's basically a celebrity at this day, 100,000 followers on his Track Your Plaque website. Incredible stuff in there. It's like a live experiment. People are sharing actual data. But this guy, anyway, went in at 52, got a calcification test. Over 400 is very serious. And he was 900 and something. And he re they sat him down and told him, look, you're likely to get a heart attack in the next couple of years, a fatal one with a score of over 900. But all his blood metrics were good, and he was 52 years old, and he was fit running three or four times a week. But the calcification test finds the calcification of your coronary arteries, and it can tell you something's wrong. But immediately he was put on Davis, one of the best in the field, down omega-6, up omega-3. His D is now up at 68 nanograms. And you'll find multiple sclerosis people as well being treated will tend to go right up to 68 to over, to kind of overcompensate. Um, that's that the way it works. He, that was because he had the resources and design to, to research and access what it is. He, exactly. What he did is, ah, well, he owns a, a big company with a huge turnover, but he took six, six months off and he traveled all over America. And he made a file that thick, which he sent to me last week, I have to get through it, about calcification. So it's another thing I'll mention in passing. The calcification test takes, and it's probably, I just, I get a little plug for electron beam coronary tomography. If I'll just take this for a second. Huh? George Lee documentary, yeah. So, get over here. So basically what you've got generally with people is you've got your um, kind of risk score from cholesterol and blood pressure and all these risks. Do you smoke or do you not smoke? And you've got very high risk people here, right? If that's your kind of risk. And these go back 40 or 50 years, Framingham risk factors. They go back a long way. And they're rough factors. So you've got smoking, you've got your old LDL. That's defunct now because it's LDL particle count you need and you can't even get it in Ireland. LDL on its own doesn't really mean anything. Uh, you've got HDL, you've got your trigs, um, you've got blood pressure, and you've got... Blood sugar should be in there, but I don't think they really do, and they bloody should. Okay, so you've got all these traditional risk factors, and you break people out as to what the risk is. And these are the guys down here, are athletes, and their cholesterol's good, and all that kind of stuff. Now, up here, you largely will see heart attacks. You know, the people who really have a lot of bad going on. And down here, you largely not see too many heart attacks. But in this whole middle area, it's a blur and you really don't know what's going to happen in there. And when you get the coronary artery calcium test, it costs a couple hundred euro. It's only usually, it's like it's a CAT scan type and an MRI type machine. It sees all the calcium in your arteries. Um, and that actually separates out the middle risk people that you're not really sure what the risk is. And it takes around 70% of them. Engineers will love this. And it either they have zero score and they have less than half a percent chance of a heart attack in the next either five or ten years. I mean, the graphs are stunning. Um, and you move a whole plethora of people down into low risk and they know they're fine. Get a CAC in another five years. And then you get people like the guy I'm talking about, 
he's got a score of 900. And he was kind of had a couple of factors. He had blood sugar, I think, was a bit high. He found out he had pre or diabetes as well at that stage and was driven by excessive carb. But anyway, um, and you move these guys have a high calcium and you move them up here and you can treat them. So it's a fantastic test, but it's not used. And the documentary was about it should be used more. But for some reason, the cardiologists don't want to use it. So the documentary got a lot of pushback from the cardiologists. Actually, I think they spoke to RTE. Um, they don't really want it becoming a test used widely, but it's 20 years old. But to an engineer, it's the, the maths alone. You don't need to know the technology. You don't need to know the biochemistry, the biology. The maths alone, you go through a CAC and you can take a big chunk of these people and some of them can walk away with nearly no risk and some of them can start getting treated. So he's made a film as well. It's called The Widowmaker and it's hopefully released next year. And it won the Boston Award for the documentary film that will help most people. Talks about four million lives you could save. So CAC test, it's a nice one. I'll be talking more about that in the future. It is. Uh, one of our guys actually found out, I think it's a couple of hundred euro. Uh, I don't know, can a doctor send you to it or do you need to be sent by a cardiologist? That's the only question. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be getting it at some point. Um, but anyway, the, the, what happens when you get a high calcium and you know you got a problem? It's low carb, omega-6 balance, and vitamin D through the roof. They're the three pillars for heart disease. And there's some other stuff as well. Obviously, sugar basically is <laughs> set your heart on fire, not in a good way. Yeah. What did I say? Plant food for cancer? You might leave the last word to sugar. Just about the worst thing you could eat. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone.